Right, it's 5.31 p.m. here on my clock, so we're going to get things started off. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to today's session. My name is Nicholas, and it's a great pleasure to host today's webinar and bring battery professionals to this event and talk about battery career paths. It is unfortunate that we can't meet in person, but at the same time, I'm really happy to be able to host this on Zoom, where we can connect with audiences all around the world to talk about this important and so this event today is organized by Intercalation Station, and we share the latest news in the battery industry through online media. You can find out more at intercalationstation.substack.com, and I've been working on this alongside my partner, Andrew Wang. We're very grateful and thankful for the Monroe Research Group at Oxford University and the Materials Research Hub for Energy Conversion, Capture, and Storage for supporting this event. A uh, quick note before we get started, a recorded version will be available and we would love to hear from you during the event as well. So we have a lot of time for questions at the very end, just 15 minutes. So please submit your questions in the Q&A chat below and we will get to them. There's also been a few questions that were submitted beforehand on Twitter and we will get to those too. If you enjoy this event, please share on your socials, on Twitter and LinkedIn. So today we have three global professionals as speakers who are so lucky to have today and I'd like to start by introducing today's topic. The battery industry is growing and evolving at an incredibly rapid pace. And as it grows, one of the inputs we need to keep up with the industry is talent, both the caliber of talent, the volume, the type of jobs available in the coming decade. There are many paths that lead into different parts of the battery industry. And so today we're interested in highlighting both the academic journey and also the industrial commercial journey both from an entrepreneurial background and a battery giant background. And to, to kick things off, let's start by doing a quick poll to see who our audience is today. Um, so let me start this poll. So I'm interested to know, you know, who our audience is, what your current role is, so we can get a better understanding of who everyone is and who we're talking to today. And so I'll just give it 30 seconds and then I'll close the poll. Awesome, so let me share the results. And as you can see, we have about half of you who are PhD candidates and that's really, really interesting to see that this is the people who are attending our talk. And that's exactly you know, the kind of early career stage scientists who we want to try to reach out to and, and share the different career journeys of different people in this path. So I'll stop sharing those results right now. And with that, I'm excited to dive into conversation and pass it over to our panelists to just do a quick introduction of yourself and your current role. And just as a warm up question, uh, what did you do at work yesterday? Over to, let's start with Shirley, who's on the first of my screen. Okay, thanks, Nick. Yeah, I'm um, very happy to be here. Uh, and uh, thanks for um, organizing this. Uh, seems to be a very unique uh, platform and event. So my name is Shirley Mun. I'm a professor at the University of California, San Diego. Um, and I run a research group called the Laboratory for Energy Storage and Conversion, LESC. Um, I also direct the center, uh, it's called the Sustainable Power and Energy Center, or I used to, actually I passed the torch to Professor Ping Liu uh, last month. Uh, I think uh, yesterday, uh, it's very easy to remember because we were um, undergoing the review by Department of Energy yesterday was the Battery 500 Consortium's uh, official review by DOE. So I'm glad I survived and uh, I'm here today. So <laughs> very happy to see everybody. Nice to see you too. Uh, let's go to Selena. Hi, I'm Selena Mikulajczyk. I am the Vice President for Engineering and Battery Technology at uh, Panasonic Energy of North America. That's the division of Panasonic that manufactures cells at the Gigafactory in Nevada. So we make many millions of cells a day uh, for um, electric vehicles. Our um, customer, many of you know, is Tesla. 
Um, it is a very big factory. In fact, it is the biggest cell making factory in the world. Um, and you feel like that when you're trying to walk through it and you try to uh, get through all the different phases of manufacturing. Um, what I did yesterday, I'm trying to remember. It's a, it gets kind of blurry. <laughs> Let's see, uh, well, we're converting a bunch of lines to a higher energy density cell right now. So um, I had a couple of meetings with the conversion team. They're dealing with some issues, you know, little things that come up when you're trying to change over a manufacturing line. Um, we've had some difficult things and some people were heroes yesterday, <laughs> getting, getting uh, problems figured out and things fixed. Um, uh, there were a couple of quality issues that uh, uh, we were looking at to determine what, you know, what our course of action was going to be um, to go forward, how we were going to resolve these things. Uh, then, it, you know, I have a team that's about 250 engineers. So there's always personnel issues. There's stuff happening. Um, you know, we're getting toward Christmas holiday, trying to make sure that we're going to have uh, enough support over the holiday, but also get people some vacation time because they've been working a lot. Um, let's see, I don't know. There were a bunch of other things. Um, it's, you know, it's a lot, right? Um, and, you know, when you get into management, um, you tend to end up uh, being pulled into lots of different areas and lots of different directions and your days go by in a blur. They're exciting, but they're a blur. It sounds exciting. Thank you. Thank you for being mm -hmm. here. Over to you, Christine. Hi everyone, um, my name is Christine Ho. I am CEO and co-founder of Imprint Energy and we build a safe green and responsibly made battery, uh, zinc printed battery actually that um, will allow us to blend electronics into our lives. We focus a lot uh, in these days around um, logistics applications, uh, medical applications. Um, this battery will help us manage our health better, take care of the environment and resources and make processes less wasteful and more efficient. Um, in terms of what I did yesterday, uh, a number of things like, like uh, both um, Selena and Shirley, uh, let's see. So I met with some other peers, other CEOs, and we, we kind of support each other as we have, you know, unique uh, personal and professional problems when we talked about that. And I think that was really helpful just to check in. Um, we just had a board meeting. And so there was a lot of, um, you know, actions from the board meeting, following up with investors and, and board members and making sure that they know our 2021 plan and they're on board with that. So um, I spent quite a bit of time on that. And then um, in addition to that, I was uh, doing last minute by holiday present uh, gift buying for uh, Imprint's holiday virtual party, which will happen uh, later today, this afternoon. So I was um, picking up some last minute gifts and thinking about some games to host for the actual party today. Thank you. That sounds like a fun party. <laughs> hope, you have, hope you all have fun. Um, I'm noticing some raised hands in, in the participants chat. Uh, we'll have questions at the end. So if you could just save those for the end, that would be really, that would be fantastic. Um, my first question, I would love to de uh, dive deep into your history. And, you know, everyone has their first moment when they realize that they wanted to work in batteries in their career. So I want to know, what was that first experience for you? And what was that moment you wanted to work and dedicate your career to energy storage and batteries? Let's go in the, in the reverse order from Christine. Sure. Um... So I, so first off, I'm a material scientist by training. I went to Berkeley for all of my degrees and how I started looking at batteries was um, through undergraduate research, um, my second year um, at Berkeley as a sophomore, my second year. And, uh, you know, before that, I don't think I really knew what material science was. And I was just really lucky. I saw a departmental ad to um, become an undergraduate researcher uh, for this graduate student in a battery group. And um, when I met him, um, I had nothing to offer. You know, I had no experience. I, all I had was enthusiasm and somehow he chose me and um, we ended up working together. Um, this person ended up being a really incredible force in my life. Uh, his name is Dan Steingard and he's actually a professor out in Columbia who still does batteries today. Um, but he just had so much enthusiasm for solving hard problems. He was opinionated and he just was obsessed with batteries and that 
was really infectious. And, and so as a result, I became really obsessed and have s since, you know, dedicated, you know, my career, my life to this. Um, so, you know, he was very much um, the, the forcing function as to why I even, um, you know, have dedicated so much time to batteries. And so I guess maybe like one, one small sort of takeaway from that is, you know, early in your career, I think um, a lot of us are looking for role models and we're looking for mentors and we learn by mimicking the people that we admire and the people that are around us. And I was just really lucky that the role model that I had, um, that I spent, you know, half a dozen years with working together closely was so smart, um, so brave, ambitious, and also really empathetic and caring. And, and so that's really kind of, I think, the reason why I'm still in this field. Yeah, mentors are so incredibly important and I'm, if we can maybe talk more about that if there's a question at the end. I, th I think it's a, it's a very, very important point and relevant to, to everyone, especially today. Uh, Selena? Um, so I'm old, okay? Like, let me preface that, I am old. So when I was an undergraduate, lithium ion wasn't even a thing, okay? It wasn't commercialized, there's no lithium ion. Um, and in grad school, there was like, lithium ion wasn't a thing at all. Um, I ended up after graduate school, I, I, I'm a mechanical engineer. I have some material science background as well. Um, I, I was really studying combustion in graduate school. And I went afterwards to work at Exponent Consulting Company. Um, and I was one of their thermal science combustion people. And I did a lot of like fire safety stuff, right? So I got this oddball project. I, I got assigned on it. Um, company wanted us to study the incidence of fires involving cell phones and gasoline stations. Because believe it or not, there was a time when people were freaking out that if you used your cell phone at the gasoline station, you could ignite an explosion. This was a thing. It was, or at least people thought it was a thing. And, you know, we studied this stuff and started looking at it and went, no, no, there's just no way, right? No, this is, this is like an urban myth. But, you know, while we were doing that, we, you know, kind of looked at the cell phone as an ignition source and it was a battery. And at that point in time, it was a nickel metal hydride battery in a cell phone. Um, so, you know, we were like, okay, you know, and that was kind of the first time in, into batteries and that little job turned into another little consulting gig where we went and looked at, uh, safety of transporting lithium ion cells on aircraft. And this was back in the late nineties, early two thousands. So I started doing some work on this and, you know, I was out in the back parking lot and, uh, with a sledgehammer and a couple of really old lithium ion cells smacking the heck out of them seeing what would happen, which in retrospect is a really bad idea. Okay, really bad idea. And then there were a few batteries cooked off and burned off in some fume hoods. Again, really bad idea. Okay, but you know, it was so new in the industry and so early, no one had any ideas really. Like, you know, we were all just kind of trying this stuff. So, you know, there was like one job and then another job and you know, you're a consultant, you're doing lots of different jobs. I did lots of things, but kind of batteries started slowly like, overtaking my life. Um, you know, I'd, I'd start getting Ziploc bags full of, you know, laptop batteries, burn laptop batteries. Here's a Ziploc bag. Why'd it catch fire? Okay, let's take it apart. Let's take a look. Um, and, you know, I, I just kind of kept doing a lot of failure analysis. And then um, people started hiring me to, you know, evaluate cells, take a look, you know, are they likely to catch fire or not? Which ones are better? Um, I did a bunch of that and things got kind of boring and then Tesla came hiring and they hired me to run cell quality at Tesla because I was kind of at that point like the world's expert on why batteries go boom, which is just kind of funny and different. Um, and it kind of, you know, crept up on me. It was like, okay, so I'm at Tesla, I was at Tesla and, you know, a couple months into it and I started realizing that all of my dreams were about lithium ion cells. Like I was dreaming about cells at night and I was like, wow, I should be really disturbed. And then I thought, well, meh, okay, I like it. It's good. At that point, I knew I was in batteries for like the rest of my career. Like it's, you know, but it kind of crept up on me. I love that you had dreams about lithium ion batteries. That's, that's quite funny. And there's another <laughs> question um, in the chat, uh, not to take a sledgehammer to batteries for people listening to this chat right now. Yeah, really bad idea. Like really bad. <laughs> okay. <laughs> What about you, Charlie? So, yeah, um, I think uh, 
I, my background is a bit like uh, uh, Christine. Uh, I'm also a trained material scientist and engineer. Um, I did my undergrad in uh, Singapore, Nanyang Technological University of Singapore. All the time, I thought I'm going to work for Boeing because I was very fascinated by the metal object that can fly and make us fly further, longer than birds. So always you know, wanted to start my career in the airplane uh, aviation industry. But I uh, failed in the internship uh, interview. Okay, don't ask me why, but I cried after that. And then one of the professors took pity on me and said, uh, okay, surely come and work with me on ceramic materials. Uh, that's in the late 90s. And uh, he was working on the superconducting oxides, uh, yttrium, barium, copper, cobalt oxide. Uh, and I had my magic moment for science that time when the magnetic levitation really happened in front of my eyes with the sample that I have made. So I think that locked in my interest for material science and engineering for sure. Um, and then I think during my search for the graduate uh, program, I was very, very lucky to uh, meet Professor Gerben Seder, who was visiting from MIT in Singapore. Uh, and uh, yeah, so everybody knows he's the guru for uh, using computational method to discover new materials. And I'm proud to say that uh, I was his first experimental graduate student. Um, I think he was at the stage where he uh, wanted to set up his own lab to uh, quickly screening materials. So I actually was quite fascinated the battery materials is layered oxide, just like the superconducting oxides that I have done in the undergraduate lab. So I think at that time, many people don't believe it, but we were searching for cobalt-free cathode. That was my first computational project, how to replace cobalt with other uh, metal elements. Um, I would say that uh, uh, my years in MIT, you know, really uh, I kind of see how um, uh, new tools like a computation, you know, supercomputers made a difference. And I think Professor Yang Xiaohong joined the MIT during the time I was there. And she introduced me about microscope. I think I got obsessed by transmission electron microscope where I actually can see the materials are indeed layered <laughs> in the microscope with the atomic resolution imaging. So yeah, I guess uh, the, the um, Parts where I really decided that this uh, uh, battery will be my career. I think it is true that if you know where the atoms are, you can arrange atoms in the right place. The final battery you make do have very good uh, properties. So yes, engineering are very important, but if the atoms are not in the right place, no matter how good your engineering is, you will not be able to make the right batteries. Uh, but the you know, if you have a good materials, you, you do good engineering, wonderful things will happen. So I, I think that's the part where I decided that I will be an academia person who really train students and uh, talents to uh, ensure that you, we do the solid science with the good engineering, we can actually make batteries that change the world. Yeah, it's a, that's a really good answer. And I think I can say this on behalf of the battery industry that we're quite thankful, I guess, that you didn't make the Boeing internship. Uh, the, the battery <laughs> world might be quite different today. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's an English expression called what? Blessing in disguise? Is that the right Blessing way? Blessing in disguise. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay, so moving on. The reason why I really like this panel is because all your current roles are so different and it's very clear as well from your background. And so, I think that's very beneficial for our audience today who are you know, PhD students and postdocs who are thinking, you know, should I go through this path or should I go through this other path? What kind of company should I go to? What kind of role should I pursue? So if you could just talk a little bit more about what you love the most about your job and what you find the most rewarding and also what you find the most challenging and maybe something that you don't enjoy that is part of your job. Let's start with, um, let's mix it up a little bit. Let's start with Selena. Hmm. So, um, 
you know, I'm, I live in the world of manufacturing at this point. I have lived in academic roles before, and um, I think it's important to appreciate both worlds um, because a lot of times, you know, you'll run into fundamental problems that have, um, that require the kind of rigor that uh, academia brings to, to examining the problem. Um, and so it's important to have that training and it's also important to have that comfort with, okay, I'm running into a problem. Let me look at the literature, right? Let me dive in and see what, you know, people who've spent their lives studying this have done. Can I find someone who studied this or studied something like this or um, can point me in the right direction? So that's really important. And it's, it's also really satisfying when you've got, you know, a wicked problem in manufacturing and you kind of know that it's based on, you know, some limits to the materials or, um, uh, you know, a fundamental problem. And you can look into the academic literature, study it, adapt it, and resolve the issue. That is hugely satisfying. At the same time, um, there's something about manufacturing that is, it's kind of like a drug. I hate to say it, but... <laughs> Um, if you're, there's something about the factory, there's a buzz to it that gets into your blood and, um, there's nothing else quite like it. It's very real. It's very present. It's very right now. There are cells coming off the line every moment. And if there's a problem, you've got to fix it fast because your customers, depending on these cells coming off the line at a certain rate, um, all the workers are there waiting right? Like you shut down a line, you're going to send everyone home, right? You know, there's a certain immediacy to it. Um, that's very uh, adrenaline inducing. Um, I don't ride roller coasters. I go to my job, uh, you know, um, for excitement. Um, it's, uh, it's also very real because the results of your work are very apparent. Um, they don't take necessarily decades to materialize. They come off the production line, like, 10 minutes later, right? Um, so it's, uh, there's nothing quite like a very, a factory, the way it, it hums, it's very alive. Um, and a lot of people putting a lot of effort together jointly to make this product. I mean, it takes thousands of people to actually produce like this. And being part of that team, that group is um, really, really satisfying. Um, it does come with a lot of responsibilities. It comes with a lot of stress. It's very difficult to unplug. Um, you know, the factory runs 24 seven, right? Uh, the shifts are 12 hours long. Um, I spend a lot of 12 hour days uh, in the factory. It, you don't get that downtime. Um, you have to carefully, you know, you have to plan and intentionally take your breaks because they're not just gonna come naturally. Um, you know, you do more management, you get a little less chance to do the engineering. You spend a lot more time resolving problems and, you know, eliminating barriers so that your team can do the engineering. Um, that's both satisfying and then sometimes a little frustrating because you're kind of like, God, I would really like to just dig into this problem. I want to study it, but you realize I can't do that. I've got to assign it to you know, one of my team members, they've got to, they're going to dig into it. I've got to be happy for them, how they do it. I can't, you know, I have to focus on all these, all these things. Um, again, super satisfying, but also has its kind of downside. So uh, that's, that's a bit about my job. Yeah, I think that's really good insight into the manufacturing world. And, you know, today in, in, in schools, I think manufacturing is often overlooked in the traditional engineering battery curriculum. And so that's, that's very valuable, valuable insight. Let's, um, can we, let's go to Christine. And I'll also note that there was a specific question on Twitter for you um, about being a founder as well. So if you could put that yeah. in your answer as well. Yeah, sure. So um, there's, there's a lot of aspects of my role and my job that are both hard and as well as really, you know, full of joy. Um, one of the hardest things I think about being in a startup is that um, you 
you have to prove that you should even exist, right? And there have been lots of people that have come to me, both well-meaning and not well-meaning, that have told me that what we're doing, you know, won't work, or that you know, that what we're concentrating on isn't worthwhile, and and that can that can be really tough, right? Um, but at the same time, I think because we've existed and because we, you know, are are doing stuff and we're actually making things, um, there's a lot of joy in knowing that we're an exception to the rule that we're an exception to the statistical chances of, of being successful, right? So, um, you know, for me on a personal level, every day feels really hard uh, in terms of uh, leading this company and also solving a lot of problems. Um, every day feels like my hardest day and then the next day is even harder uh, because for me, every problem um, that bubbles up is probably something that I've never seen and I've never tackled before. Um, you know, imprint for me in particular, it's it's my first and only job. You know, I've been at this for 10 years. Um, so every day is is a new problem. There's a new responsibility that I've had no experience with that lands on my plate. So that in itself, I think being uh, my first time founder, first time CEO can be really challenging. Um, there are certain decisions that I'll have to make that can really be heart-wrenching at times. There's no amount of data that can guarantee the outcome and yet we have to put a stake in the ground. Um, there's also challenges in working in this industry, especially in the battery industry um, and in and sort of like um, a really sort of um, old and incumbent industry. Um, I've had to sit through negotiations with large company executives telling me that I, because I didn't have enough white hair on my head that my, ideas and my proposals weren't valid, you know, and, and that's, that's hard to face down, you know, when that's, um, when that, when that's right in front of you. Um, I've had to deal with uh, looking at our bank account and, and seeing the dollars literally just dwindle away <laughs> day by day and worrying about our finances. So, um, so those are challenging things. And then I think also on a personal level, um, I'm a first time mom, I have a two year old and having to be away from my son and um, miss, you know, his, his early milestones. Those are really hard days, you know, sitting in airports and, and, and missing, missing family, missing um, home time. So there's plenty of hard days, um, but at the same time, there's a lot of joy as well. You know, I'm, I'm really proud that we've grown a, a diverse and inclusive company. We have 15 people at Imprint, um, but a broader network of contractors and interns and various people working with Imprint. Um, I'm really excited that we make a product that delights customers. You, there's there's no greater joy for me than seeing a customer light up and say like, yeah, that solves my problem. You like, you know, I was dreaming about this and and now it exists. That's, you know, that's a really amazing feeling. Shipping real products. Um, we've shipped probably about 100,000 batteries at the, thus far, which uh, for me is a lot. And we're, we're hoping to ship millions like Selena. So we're, you know, every day that we ship more, it's so exciting. Being an inventor too, having, hand-painted batteries in the lab to now seeing that on scaled automated equipment there's there's a lot of um real joy in that so overall i think there's unbalanced plenty of joy but also plenty of hardship in, in this role yeah i'm going to tell you the gray hair it doesn't help it doesn't help that's a great answer thanks christine and for your openness as well i, I wanted to ask just for clarification is it and how, how did, was that linked to your PhD research at UC Berkeley and how, what was the birth of that company like? Yes, yeah, um, the technology that Imprint commercializes today was based on my PhD work. And so we spun out the technology from the university. Uh, there, was a, there was a class that really was kind of the, the impetus for starting the company called Clean Tech to Market out of the business school. It helped develop go-to-market strategies for new inventions um, in, in the climate space. And so um, in that semester, I got a chance to speak with industry folks, customers, partners, investors, and it just created the emotional courage for us to start the company. Um, and it created kind of like a roadmap for us to get going. Uh, so, you know, it's, it, it was really difficult to make that sort of decision, but when we made, when we had that courage, we leapt and then, you know, the momentum has just really kind of grown from there. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for clarifying. I think it's important because there, there's a, there's a growing trend in a lot of battery startups, spin outs coming out from a university setting and PhD founders. And so your, your experience is very re relevant to our audience as well. 
Uh, Shirley, over to you. Sure, yeah. So from the academic perspective, I think, uh, um, you know, I, I really, really enjoy my job. I think a part of the reason is that uh, my product is actually the students, uh, the, the people uh, who are the products from my research group. Over the last, uh, I would say, 12 years, uh, I think we trained about, uh, you know, if we include a post-grad, um, grad, master, undergrad, uh, my group would probably send about 70 people to the field and many of them, uh, some of them, Selena and uh, Christine have met, I think, uh, um, you know, so if you, if, if I think about uh, the impact of a professor have on the student, I think, uh, um, you know, that gives me satisfaction. I think that's where when one ask yourself if academic career is the right way to go, this is a very important criteria, in my opinion, because uh, we can easily get lost for the pursuit of high age index and uh, funding levels. Uh, but to me, I think, uh, um, you know, um, I remember <laughs> uh, that the, the, the influence a good teacher has on the student, uh, just the lasting uh, lifelong. I personally, of course, had the great uh, pleasure meeting a few very nice uh, teachers, I mean, including my, uh, you know, high school or middle school teachers. Um, I think a professor's first job is actually an education uh, person. And of course, you know, today in the United States, I think a lot of the professors um, are like entrepreneur, we have to raise the funding for uh, uh, our um, research. But uh, to me, those really are the means to the end. Uh, in the end that uh, the students coming out from my lab are the uh, products I'm most proud of. And one nice thing, uh, differences between the uh, people as the output of the uh, place is that uh, uh, I always imagine yeah, when I'm celebrating my, I don't know, 70, 80 or 90, I will see the products still and uh, we'll be able to see how they do, like how they have progressed as a person, right? So I think uh, my group actually is pretty big, um, something like uh, 30, 40 people at any time. But the way how I train the students, I believe that uh, it's not, a professor's job is to train the people how to think uh, and to get them ready for, uh, you know, very demanding industry uh, like, uh, you know, what Christine and uh, Selena have um, said, uh, it, it should give them confidence where any challenges they will be able to overcome. And I, I hope that I did an okay job because um, one professors can only do that many, train that many students. Uh, but I really want to emphasize that when these things are in place, the productivity is a natural consequences of that. Uh, and we must uh, always remember our primary job um, is not for the pursuit of funding and the number of publications. Uh, of course, it takes, you know, it, it gives me even greater pleasure if uh, after my time has ended on the planet Earth, you know, everybody will go at some point. Uh, some of the papers that we have published, uh, people still say, okay, this is right, you know, this is correct. And I think uh, most of the scientists should not forget 99% uh, of the literature gets forgotten in the literature. Only the real good ones um, preserved with human history. And I think uh, um, this is something my dad taught me that uh, you should always aim for that. If you decide to be a scientist, you want to be someone, you know, after your passing, people still find your work very, very valuable. So from personal perspective, I think that's uh, really the great challenge for all the uh, professors. Um, yeah, the, I think the downside is, of course, um, uh, sometimes, uh, uh, yeah, professors uh, uh, can be stressed out and then can, you know, uh, got a little bit, uh, uh, I don't know, sidetracked by all the university politics and things like that. So students don't always see the best side of the professors. I think uh, the, the, the um, challenge of how to ensure every student to you know, get their, I mean, I would say in my early days, I did have 
uh, disappoint some students or postdocs. Uh, that's definitely a reality. Uh, so yeah, that I think, uh, uh, unfortunately, as a PhD student, we are not trained how to manage this role as a professor who will become a mentor. Naturally, we are advisor for those young folks. And I think, you know, I, I would say that uh, uh, if given the opportunity now, all the postdocs in my research group will receive trainings how to mentor students and uh, undergrads and grads. I think it's a part of the trainings that's very much being overlooked. Yeah, I think that's, that's you know, and a lot to think about for all the aspiring professors in this chat today. Mm -hmm. I wanna dive a little bit into, back into what you said earlier, Christine, I'm gonna put you on the spotlight, um, but it's about diversity. And you know, as we were planning this event, I was browsing around different battery leaders and seeing who we could invite. And I, I noticed that it's quite obvious the majority of the field are men. And so my question is, how can we as an industry help encourage and support more women in batteries? And I'll also, you know, I'll point out that there's also a, a question, several questions on Twitter asking, asking this. So um, it's, it's very relevant and very important. Yeah, thank you. And I think it's a really important question. Um, you know, in in the broader energy sector, um, there's less than 22% women in the workforce. And I would I would venture to guess, um, Selena might also have some statistics, but I, I'm sure the battery industry is actually even lower, maybe in the single digits. Um, you know, there obviously this is a topic that is important and there has been movement in the right direction. You know, today there's less than 5% of Fortune 500 companies have female CEOs. Uh, but, you know, even just a few days ago, NASDAQ uh, uh, announced that they want to require companies um, listed, you know, on their stock exchange to improve board diversity, include women and, and um, other uh, minorities on boards. Um, California just recently signed a bill that requires California companies headquartered in California to at least have one minority on the board. And certain banks are saying that they won't take companies public unless they have a diverse board. So there are these um, indicators that things are going to get better, but these are still slow moving um, processes. These are slow moving changes. And so what I would like to focus on is the fact that I believe that startups in particular are a really important force for changing this industry and especially the battery industry where we're really poised to grow and shift very significantly due to all these sort of market forces. I think startups will play a really important role of, of you know, the entire ecosystem. Um, and one reason for that is if you look at the statistics around startups, um, in the US, 14% of startups have female CEOs rather than less than 5%. So not great, but better. Um, but there's this really important research that was done recently by Silicon Valley Bank that showed that um, for companies with diverse founding teams, meaning at least one woman on the founding team, 50% of those companies have female CEOs, whereas um, female CEOs only lead about 5% uh, of male only founding teams. And um, the Kaufman uh, Fellows study also showed that startups with one female founder is two and a half times more likely to hire women. And a startup with a female founder and a female CEO is six times more likely to hire women. And um, yet, you know, 9% of investment dollars go to women led ventures. So, you know, what I'm what I what I see from that is that it's really important to influence the start the the seeds of new companies because um, by encouraging diverse founding teams you have the potential to set the stage for a diverse company that will grow from that that the, that founding team and so when I look at that that tells me that universities in particular. Um, incubators and early investors are really influential in bringing diversity into this field. Um, universities can encourage founding teams and encourage um, uh, teams with, you know, that include women, that include minorities, business competitions. If you're going to award and recognize startups, you have to, you should, you know, ensure that they're diverse. Uh, investors, if you're writing the first check to a company, demand that 
that founding team is diverse. Accelerators only accept, you know, diverse founding teams. I think that initial seed is really important and it can really rapidly change diversity in many companies, but the battery company, battery companies in particular, I think are in, in, in this really interesting place where there's such a big chance for growth and opportunity that I think startups uh, are a big vehicle for changing that um, statistic. Yeah, it's definitely gonna be a whole effort on the whole startup ecosystem, um, including the ones you mentioned, like the startup and the investors, but everything in between as well, accelerators, incubators, angel investors, um, advisors even, um, everyone's, it's gonna be a lot of, uh, a big effort. But I, I think we see that trend happening um, at a startup and venture capital level. So it's very promising. Uh, Professor Shirley, would you like to go next? Um, I think in, um, your original question to Christine is particularly towards the, the, the um, diversity issue, right? Yeah, yes. so <laughs> yeah, in terms of uh, students coming to us, um, particularly at undergraduate level, uh, I don't think we have a um, serious problem. We call our academia a leaking pipe issues because you can see on the undergrad, uh, actually more than 50% of the degree is rewarded to females. And then the higher we go, I guess, uh, you know, the um, less, you know, uh, female or uh, underrepresented minorities are seen. Actually, this is a, a, a topic that the, uh, the academic field really try to uh, uh, figure out what is the fundamental reason, but um, I'm, quite optimistic in the energy industry, uh, this uh, uh, diversity or inclusion issues will be um, making a lot of progress, I believe, because um, I think they, they were saying that why um, in the medical field, the um, uh, say biological engineering, bio-related field, uh, we very quickly resolved the, the gender issue. So those fields now are almost gender equal. Um, why in the energy field and in the engineering field, this is still such a big problem. Uh, I think the career choice in the beginning is uh, in the past uh, when we choose engineering uh, or you know the energy industry as our the platform to launch our career. I think it's not so clear what we do will have a real positive impact on the society. I think right now it's very clear, right? People who work in the battery industry, we are making a better world for everyone in the planet. Um, and uh, I think uh, once that happens, I, I would like to say we really see a really uh, high flux of uh, students who would like to choose this area as the focus of their study. And once the pool become larger, then we have more um, opportunities to actually in, uh, you know, encourage diversity and inclusion. Uh, I think that's uh, started to happening right now, uh, but uh, at the same time, yeah, I definitely appreciate the, all the statistics uh, Christine has shared with us. Uh, the, uh, you know, cutthroat um, nature of our industry uh, really, you know, is one of the factors scared away a lot of my female colleagues or students. But right now, I think that the uh, support structures are much more um, encouraging. So I'm hoping, I'm hopeful that, uh, you know, uh, in the next generation or two, that this issue will be um, um, yeah, much better resolved. And it also, you know, I want to emphasize that it takes a lot of efforts from the entire uh, um, community. You know, I, I was very lucky. I had the same experience as Christine sitting in the airport and uh, Miss Kit's uh, milestones. Yeah, so uh, to have a partner who's actually really supportive of our career goals, I think we are, uh, you know, every successful woman, I wouldn't use a successful, but every uh, career already entered the woman, we need the equal partnership uh, in the, at home so that the career goals can be achieved. And all those things, I think, uh, 
the society societal change is happening. So I'm optimistic uh, that uh, our field uh, will, will be doing better in the years to come. Yeah, thanks for that answer. Um, I think it's, it's quite one, one thing you pointed out was that the diversity and the basically who you have in the universities, ultimately those are the, the that's the talent pool who will be fed into all the future battery companies like batteries like Panas uh, companies like Panasonic. And so what are your comments on that, Selena? Yeah, so I've been doing this a while. Um, when, I was, when I was at Tesla, I ran a smaller team. It was about 40. And uh, my leaders and I decided that we were going to have a diverse team. And we actually achieved 50% women on that team, which was anomalous, right? People were kind of shocked. And, you know, I, I learned a few things about that. The first thing is um, when you have a diverse team, it is fundamentally more stable, okay? Um, I had the highest morale team. Um, they could support each other in ways that are just different than if your team is very homogenous, right? So um, everyone comes to problems with different strengths, weaknesses, perspectives. And if you manage to have not, not a token individual, but a really diverse team, um, those perspectives, those approaches, whether they're about problem solving, about um, technical issues, about uh, just, you know, emotional stability, all just, they just get easier, right? So, so it's a stronger team if you have a diverse team. However, we also learned that we had to be intentional about this. Diverse teams don't just kind of happen, okay? Because it's super easy to hire people that look like you. It's super easy to hire people that look like what engineers look like on TV, um, right? Uh, you know, people will say that, you're, you know, how you're rated in terms of competence has a lot to do with your height, right? Like tall people are believed to be more confident than sharp people. Guess what? Women are short and the high heels, they don't make up for that, okay? I'm going to be five foot four forever. I'm never going to be a six foot tall guy, right? So it's super easy to kind of, if you don't pay attention, to suddenly find yourself with a non-diverse crew. So you have to be intentional about it. You have to look at women and minority candidates and say, okay, they don't look like what I expect, but what have they got? You know, and when you start doing that, you realize, wow, these people are amazing, right? And, you know, I, it, was, it was astounding. I would hire interns, um, you know, and I was just kind of wondering why all my colleagues hadn't grabbed these women, amazing women first. Like I was, oh my God, I was getting these amazing women. But I just, I realized they just didn't look like the part. And, you know, I, I would struggle with this too. Like, you know, I'd hire a bunch of nice, nice interns. And then I was like, wow, can I really send them into the factory? They look kind of small, right? <laughs> you know, and, and, and it was like, I'm like, well, I go into the factory. I can totally send them into the factory. They'll be fine. Right. But, you know, you, you have that moment where you're like, oh, my God, they don't look like they're going to be able to, you know, tough it out there. And you're like, oh, come on, give them give them the break They're They've gone through engineering school. They've done this. They're just as tough as all the guys. Send them in there. It turns out to be true. So but you have to like, you know, even as a woman, you have to catch yourself going, uh, OK, let me make sure my expectations are proper. So, um so I learned that. And then, um, you know, and I came to Panasonic, uh, the team I joined initially is a smaller, I was running a smaller group here initially. Um, I was very fortunate that the group had developed a very strong, diverse culture. Um, and it was a very diverse team. And, you know, I've expanded the group substantially and, and kind of coalesced a couple of groups. And we're very aggressive about um, hiring a diverse group of people. Because again, we find it very um, stabilizing to the morale um, and to the skill of the group. The other thing, though, you also have to do if you're managing these kinds of groups is you have to support strong women leaders and you have to support women into leadership because you can hire a lot of women right out of school and, you know, in the entry level, everything's good, but then you have to support these women to become leaders. And um, there's some challenges there. You know, uh, I am abrasive, okay? I've been called abrasive so many times. I've owed it now, I'm abrasive. Um, 
but that's something that, you know, those comments about women leaders, sharp elbows, abrasive, kind of a bitch, all those things, um, you hear it all the time. Um, you have to find a way for your women leaders to um, succeed where that's one of the risks, right? You have to support the strong women leaders and that's from upper management that has to come that, you know, a woman comes and presents at a meeting and says some strong things, um, how you support that um, and, and give her credibility is hugely important to determine whether she's gonna stay in the field or not. I mean, if you have a great woman and you know, she's technically strong or you know, a great person of minority, they're technically strong, they show up at a meeting and you discount their stuff, you haven't heard it, they're not gonna stay in the field, right? That's your leaky pipe, right? So it's really incumbent on management to support that diversity um, in, the, in the workplace. And you know, at Panasonic, um, it's a super interesting company at Tena because um, you know, we've got so much, uh, so much of cell making has come from Japan and we have so many Japan members, some that are expats, some that are tech technical advisors that come see us. Uh, sometimes uh, engineers come to deal with certain issues that, you know, to help us with certain issues where they've been doing um, development in Japan, they want to bring it into Pena. So, you know, our company is um, full of people from Japan who kind of speak English, right? We've got translators. We're struggling to understand each other, two very different cultures already in the mix. And um, it kind of gives you a different perspective because not everyone doesn't look the same, right? Um, you know, to the Japanese members, they're all these super tall, loud Americans, me included, right? Uh, to us, we're like, oh my God, all these Japanese and they're speaking Japanese and I don't understand it and oh my God, right? So that drives a lot of that um, attempt to understand and attempt to accept more diversity, but it's still, a, it's still a challenging thing. And it's something that, you know, everyone has to, to think about. Yeah, thank you, Selena. Extremely relevant, extremely important. And uh, I'm, I'm very appreciative of all your, all, your, all your time and comments today. And that concludes our first part. Uh, we've got about seven minutes for q and I'm gonna try, I don't think we're gonna get through all of them. We've got about nine questions in the q and but I'll try to pick out the ones that I, I think have the most overlap with the other questions and what we've talked about today. The first one is from Chen Ren. Um, she asks, how do you see your specialty? What if your specialty has a limited time window? For example, lithi uh, liquid lithium ion batteries being replaced by solid state batteries, silicon anode being replaced by lithium metal. How do you keep yourself important and unreplaceable no matter how these different technologies change? And for Q&A, I think it'd be best if we just have one person answer. Just whoever would be best suited so that we can get through as many questions as possible. I will do this one. Sounds like this is a question for the professor because in the manufacturing, it's not that quick to actually replacing something. <laughs> yeah, that's right. No. <laughs> so um, as a, a suggestion, I think uh, it's very important for the uh, graduate students or for undergraduate students, for anyone who are doing training in lab, always remember knowledge is limited. Um, your own knowledge is always limited. So um, the, the challenge here is, of course, you become one particular subject expert, right? And then I use this thing to my students, 10,000 hours. There is no shortcut. If you want to be an expert in certain subject, you look at the 10,000 hours, you think we just randomly decide the PhD will take five years? No. That's carefully crafted because in five years, you will be able to accumulate 10,000 hours on that particular subject that you have chosen. And you will be the subject expert if you have done the entire training properly. Uh, so this subject expert is one thing. The other thing is I was saying the critical thinking ability, the courage of not afraid of picking up any new things um, and then uh, one particular skill set, I think I told my students, because surely it's always, uh, my team always do um, fancy characterization. So we call it a fancy characterization because we have something, I call it making the invisible visible. So there are things in the engineering devices using the tools we have, you will be able to see something 
naked eyes cannot see or other people cannot uh, realize where is the problem. So I think that uh, uh, for me, the um, uh, confidence really comes from after you finish the training, you think you can pick up anything, any new topics that boss gives you, any, you know, if you go for entrepreneurial route, you will be able to um, um, come out with a new idea that other big companies with 200 PhDs, they never thought about it, right? So I think that uh, um, uh, the goal is not to think about how to predict the future because you cannot predict the future. Uh, I think the goal is to equip yourself with, with the ability that you can actually handle any challenges up to your way. And you will be able to learn quickly, apply your critical thinking and the problem solving skills and have the courage, the confidence and the courage that I can handle the new challenges coming to my way. And I think that, uh, you know, Selena has hired many students, uh, 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 people, coming. I'm very sure that uh, those things are uh, uh, companies are really looking for because um, uh, I was told uh, uh, by my students, a lot of the knowledge I taught to them is irrelevant in the manufacturing side. <laughs> but they still get a job because they demonstrate they are willing to learn, they can mm -hmm. learn, and they're not afraid. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Thanks, Charlie. Uh, question for Selena. Could you say a little bit more about pivoting from one field to another? My background is also in thermal and fire science. I'm looking to pivot to energy storage. It's been very challenging to reach out and speak to people within the industry because of my background. Do you have any advice? Question from Ram H. Well, first off, thermal sciences and battery safety is your way in. Um, there's a lot of uh, effort spent in you know trying to understand how you control um, the a thermal energy release in cells. Um, and a lot of people are looking for uh, folks to really tackle that problem. Um, if you're gonna make a car, you sure, sure as heck don't want a single cell thermal runaway burning your car to the ground. So um, there's tons of work there. And, and that's kind of, you know, in a lot of ways how I entered the field. Um, you know, you're not looking for an electrochemistry job. That's not your passion. You're looking for a battery safety job. Um, and then the other thing that I look at is, you know, um, you know, when I started my career, uh, it, like I said, batteries weren't even a thing and they weren't real. It, there, you know, I was thinking aerospace and there was mechanical engineering. My first job was in the oil field. Then I went to graduate school. Then I went been a thermal science consultant. I mean, I've changed jobs, like changed career paths like five times, right? Um, People right at the beginning of the career, they're stressing out very heavily, like, oh my God, if I don't pick the right thing, it's going to be like, you know, terrible. Um, probably you're not going to pick the right thing the first, couple, first time, right? But, you know, you work, do your work with passion, go after the things that interest you, and uh, you're going to find your career evolve. And you know, you're going to take the expertise you had from, you know, your first, first couple of endeavors, and you're going to bring that really interesting expertise into a new area. And do some great things with it and you know just just go after the follow the engineering passion there's lots to do yeah it's very great advice and advice that applies not just to the battery world but just life in general so good mm -hmm. them one last question um apologies i can't get to all of them but this question is from brian lee how difficult would you say it is for chemical engineers with a background in electrochemistry to transit to transition into the battery industry in, ex in your experience, is there enough overlap to break in without a more advanced degree, like a, a master's or a PhD specializing in direct battery work? And I think this could be a good um, question for, <clears throat> for you, Christine. Maybe you can talk about the kind of career levels that you hire at Imprint as well. Yeah, I think um, just a short answer, because I know we're short on time, but uh, I think there's a lot of opportunities, um, and I, I think that you'll find that um, you'll have choices, you know, uh, without an advanced degree or transitioning in, into the field, like Selena and, and Shirley were both saying, I think we're looking for people that have um, great skills, you know, a hunger to learn, um, hard, hard work ethic, and uh, for me, you know, I, I also like to find people that want to 
be communi good communicators. They want to learn how to tell good stories. Um, and, and that's oftentimes an indicator of growth and potential leadership in, in somebody. So, um, so I wouldn't worry so much about, you know, where you are today and what sort of a degree you have today. I think it's a matter of just finding those opportunities and showcasing that you're willing to grow in that position. Um, and, uh, you know, feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to comment more on that um, offline as well. Yeah, I mean, uh, have you seen a mixing room? I mean, this is a chemical engineer's dream. Oh my yeah. God, <laughs> this is like big fats and tanks and, you know, powders and liquids coming and mixing and, you know, the process control is huge and it's super important. Then you go to coding. I mean, uh, yeah, there's room for chemical engineers, believe me. Mm -hmm. Great, well, thank you all for your time. And I'd like to give a big virtual round of applause to our speakers today for sharing the time. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. I really hope that you all enjoyed the session for those watching today. <clears throat> we really appreciate your feedback. So please reach out. And as Christine mentioned, um, reach out to their Twitters and, and their emails if, if, if you have more questions. And remember to share our event on social media. Thanks again so much, everyone, for coming. Happy holidays. Stay safe. And thanks again. Happy holidays to everyone. And Selena, yeah. and Christine, okay. thank you. Great pleasure to be with you today. Yeah, and hear your life stories is really inspiring. Likewise, thank you. Likewise. And thanks Nick, everyone. Nick and Andrew, thank you so much for organizing this. Yeah, thanks, absolutely. Bye. All right, happy holidays, Bye. everyone. Take care. Bye. <laughs> Bye.